in this era of tremendous success, the persistent problem of the achievement gap. And that is the focus, of course, of this study. Um, the charts that are on, on the screen, which are a little small, are in, your, uh, are in the um, executive summary, which are on your, on your chair. Um, in this report, we define the achievement gap, uh, we focus on the achievement gap in three different areas. Uh, first, uh, the gap between white and African American students in their educational achievement, uh, the gap between white and Latino uh, children in their achievement, and then the gap um, based on income. And in the state of Arkansas, we see the persistent achievement gap in all three of these areas. Now, the charts that are shown here are, uh, indicate the gaps from the NAEP test uh, in fourth and eighth grade. Um, on, uh, if you look at the screen, in uh, the dark, dark blue, those are uh, the scores for uh, white children, and we do see the increase across time, uh, especially um, uh, um, at the, in the math, uh, a little flatter in terms of reading. Uh, but we see other groups not uh, thriving at the same levels as white Arkansas school children. In yellow, we have the Latino numbers. Um, in, um, in, in, in lighter blue, uh, the low income numbers, and we, base, uh, we define low income as those students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, and then the pink um, is, uh, are the numbers for African American uh, students in Arkansas. Now, in this report, while we focus on those three different gaps, we define the achievement gap in a very broad way. Here we have test scores, and in the report also, of course, the importance of the Arkansas benchmark, uh, benchmark exam, but it's not just test scores. It is also graduation rates, it's college going rates, it's remediation rates. The gaps show themselves in all of these areas of, of educational um, achievement. Now, this is obviously an American problem, but other states have shown tremendous, tremendous success. So it is a persistent problem, but it is not an intractable problem. The purpose of our study to begin to think about how our, what Arkansas could do to really tackle the achievement gap. How did we go about this? First, um, beginning uh, in the spring, uh, we immersed ourselves in this really vast literature that is out there on the interventions that have uh, shown success in closing the achievement gap. In this immersion in uh, the literature, we really focused on statewide interventions, those things that are at a scale that, that would be tackled by a state. Now, Keith and I did a lot of this work, but we had tremendous help in this. And we had two great research assistants who are right here in the front row. Uh, first off, uh, Sarah Argue, who is a first year student uh, at the Clinton School of Public Service, and Russ Montgomery, who is a 2007 graduate of Hendricks College, and we really could not have carried out this study without them, and we thank them very much uh, for their work uh, on this. And they can stand. Yes, please. Now, when we look at this research, uh, while it is, uh, it is huge in, in, quali in quantity, it varies dramatically in quality. Uh, is that some of this research is, is, is not particularly good research. Um, and it is, I think, in many cases, uh, driven by those, uh, the proponents of the programs at, at, at hand. Um, it is very difficult, as many of you know, to really track the success of particular programs in the educational arenas because children are developing naturally, intellectually, across time. So it's very difficult to get at. And so we developed a, a, a standard that we really wanted to focus on those things where the social scientific method had been used in an appropriate way to really give us confidence that these interventions had mattered in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing success with closing the achievement gap. Now, uh, we can, in the re full report, we have a lot more on the methodology and how we kind of, uh, uh, what criteria we used in, uh, in saying that reports were high quality. Uh, we can also answer questions uh, about that at the end. After we kind of looked at this vast array of, of literature, we came back together and really said, OK, there really are nine big areas uh, where, um, which have shown success, uh, nine general areas of interventions where solid research shows evidence for success in closing the achievement gap. 
And this highlights the point that there is no single answer, is that it takes a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach uh, to closing the achievement gap. After synthesizing the research in each of these nine areas, we then ask the question, what has Arkansas done in this area in terms of its programming to, close, to take the steps that could have promise for closing the achievement gap um, in Arkansas? Now, as Skip noted at the beginning, this, is, this was a collaborative effort with Arkansas advocates and with the uh, Arkansas Public Policy Panel. I think it's important to emphasize how much autonomy Keith and I had in this process in that those guys um, prodded us with questions, but ultimately the judgments that are articulated in this report are our, are our judgments and are very independent um, analyses of, of what works and what Arkansas has done in this regard. Now, the first two areas, the first two of the nine areas, are areas in which Arkansas has done a great deal in the Lakeview era. Um, but they are two areas where we think that there's probably, looking forward, limited promise for additional, additional closing of the achievement gap. The first important area is the area of facilities improvement. Now, research clearly indicates that facilities matter in shaping the educational outcomes of the children who learn or attempt to learn um, in those school facilities. The lighting of buildings, the acoustics of the facilities, the air quality, uh, the comfort of those facilities as a learning environment, and the technology that's present, all of those things matter in terms of enhancing uh, the learning outcomes that occur within. And Arkansas, because of the Lakeview decision and the court's persistent uh, requirement that facilities be brought into the picture and be made adequate, uh, Arkansas has done a lot and continues to do a lot in terms of school facilities. And we certainly celebrate that work and of course recommend that that, that work be, uh, be seen through to its end. Unfortunately, however, uh, we don't feel that this is going to be an area in which tremendous closing of the achievement gap occurs. Um, the major reason is that there really is no correlation between the quality of the school buildings that were studied by the, the, the task force that looked at this and the income levels of students. Is that, of course, because of the high growth areas in northwest Arkansas, uh, these are, are not particularly poor districts. Uh, there is also not much of a relationship between Latino student population and the quality of buildings. There is a correlation between uh, the percentage of African American students in schools and the quality of buildings. And therefore, the improvements that are occurring, we would expect to possibly have some impact in terms of closing the, the race gap between, between white and African American students. But we don't expect that to have a huge impact. And therefore, it really, we feel, uh, calls for more targeted approaches to really attack the achievement gap. The second area in which Arkansas has done a great deal in, in the last years is in the area of curriculum and instructional strategies. The materials that teachers present matter in closing the achievement gap. And particularly important in terms of the curriculum is in the area of reading. And we know the importance of reading, um, uh, enhancing reading skills in the early ages in terms of closing the achievement gap. Um, under the leadership of the State Department of Education, Arkansas has done a good job of implementing best practice curricular and instructional interventions. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has praised Arkansas for the rigor of its curricular standards, including the SMART core curriculum. And with regard to specific interventions to close the achievement gap, uh, the part partnerships in comprehensive literacy, reading recovery, and success for all programs have all been widely adopted, and each has proven effective. Uh, Arkansas poli uh, policymakers, again, should be congratulated on their efforts to improve curriculum and instruction in Arkansas. But because many of these successful programs and systems are in place and have been in place for a number of years, we believe that it is unlikely that additional reform in curricular instruction will have much additional impact on the achievement gap. So two areas in which Arkansas is doing good things, unfortunately, they may not have a lot of impact on the achievement gap. But there are seven other areas that provide outstanding opportunities for closing the achievement gap. Keith will cover those, and then I'll come back, close things up, and open it up to Q&A from, from you guys. Thanks, Jay. So we've got seven areas in which we make recommendations for taking steps to close the achievement gap. 
The first three are areas in which the state has done a lot, but we think that there are opportunities for expanding the progress made. Early childhood education. Jay talked about the advances in the Arkansas Better Chance program, Arkansas Better Chance program. Um, students whose families are at 200% of federal poverty level are eligible for the program. If you look at the research related to the achievement gap, the strongest evidence for reducing the achievement gap comes from pre-K programs. And that, we looked at that in terms of uh, the rigor of the control groups that they used and then testing that longitudinally over time. I don't think there's any argument that I would make that there's a better intervention. Now the issue is whether or not families send their children to preschool. Children are eligible, but the take-up rates may not be where we would want them to be. So our recommendation, therefore, is that we have a public communications effort to encourage um, people to realize the benefits for sending your children to preschool so that you can have a higher take-up rate. Teacher quality. Education research says that uh, good teachers do the best at teaching students. Also says that, uh, unfortunately, the least qualified and least experienced teachers tend to teach the lowest income and minority students. So there's a distribution issue across the country about where the teachers go. The state has done a really nice job um, in providing some financial incentives to help encourage teachers to move to high priority districts. Um, the state's also given an incentive for teachers to become more trained uh, through national board certification. The thing that we think is really interesting and exciting about what the state's doing is developing a longitudinal tracking system for students. And the reason this is interesting is because It'll allow the state to have more data to figure out how teachers are trained, how they're hired, and how they're developed in service so that we could better target those programs to the students who need them the most. Um, so accordingly, our recommendation is that that longitudinal tracking system, which puts Arkansas at the cutting edge of what's going on nationally, be aggressively adopted. Last area is uh, high quality charter schools. We looked at all the school choice literature and we concluded that there are some high quality charter schools that have these three characteristics, extended learning time, rigorous professional development, strong school leadership, that have been proven to reduce the achievement gap. Um, as a result, our recommendation is that if we have any new charter schools, that they be focused on reducing the achievement gap and that when the State Department of I'm sorry, when the State Board of Education um, accepts charter recommendations, that they look carefully at whether or not those charter applications use research-proven methodologies for reducing the achievement gap. So those are three areas uh, that Arkansas has done quite a bit. There's areas for improvement there. And these next four areas are areas in which we think there's a lot of opportunity for gains because Arkansas hasn't done that much or is not doing that much right now. The first area is in school-based health. The literature out there says that there's a causal link between how much time children spend in school and how much they're retained in grade, how much they graduate, or when, if they will graduate, what their test scores will be, and whether or not they go to school, or whether or not they go to college, I should say. Now, unfortunately, the children who um, are least healthy and therefore least likely to spend time in their seats in the classroom are low-income and minority children. Arkansas has a coordinated school health initiative, which is now uh, in 30 schools. We recommend that that coordinated school health initiative be expanded to all schools and that we specifically state funding to support school-based health clinics in every school. Out of school programs. These are summer programs and after school programs. Researchers have found that summer learning loss is a big cause of the achievement gap. And that's because children who are more affluent have more opportunities for intellectual and social development during the summer, so they lose less over the summer, whereas children who don't have those opportunities slide back. You see a citation there. In Baltimore, they found that two-thirds of the African-American white reading gap is due to what happens over the summer. 
Um, in Arkansas, we have a federally supported uh, 21st Century Community Learning Center program. Um, the Arkansas Out of School Network is also working on a statewide initiative to expand the access to summer programs and after school programs. Um, but we do not have a statewide funding system and we do not have statewide quality assessment systems. So if you look at where Arkansas is in comparison out of school programs in pre-K, we're ahead of the curve or right at the the leading edge on pre-K, we're behind in after school and summer programs. Um, the, governor's task for, the governor has created a task force on after school and summer programs. And so we recommend that those recommendations be aggressively implemented when they come out. Class size reduction is um, another intervention that's been proven by research, both longitudinally and through using uh, randomized control groups to improve test scores and graduation rates, particularly for African-American students. The most famous study was done in Tennessee. When the Tennessee policymakers reduced class sizes in the early grades, K through three, to 13 to 17 students, they saw significant gains in how much those students learned. They compared those gains to what teachers with AIDS or teachers in regular sized classrooms had, and their superior gains, and those gains lasted over time. We have no statewide class size reduction initiative in Arkansas. It's a very expensive program because it means hiring a lot more teachers. Um, one caveat I would add is in California, which is where I did my graduate work, we reduced class sizes across the board and it had a counterproductive effect because there weren't enough qualified teachers for every classroom. So teachers tended to go to richer suburban school districts and that statistic I had earlier where it said that the less qualified, less experienced teachers tend to teach in high minority and low income neighborhoods. That really happened in California. So the implementation is important. You have to think about that. Our recommendation, we think about giving state funding targeted to schools with high proportions of low income, African American, or Latino students. The last area, um, which is very interesting I think, is uh, parental engagement and community organizing. This gets back to what Jay was talking about earlier, that this is a holistic, multi-pronged approach. Um, we're talking about not just what happens in schools, but what happens in communities, what happens in, in parents' homes. And this is a way for the, the state or the government to encourage more collaboration and more engagement outside of schools. So Arkansas is a hippie program, is uh, at the cutting edge of what's going on in trying to train parents to become um, more self-confident, have more tools um, in being parents. Home visits, um, and you see a lot of improvement in child's behavior as well as their academic achievement. Arkansas also has uh, these schools of the 21st century. They're supported by the uh, Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, and those have had some promising gains, again, in collaborating across homes, communities, and schools. Um, in Texas, they've got something called the Industrial Areas Foundation which uh, is actually what Barack Obama worked for in, in Chicago when he was a community organizer, but this, this one's in Texas. And uh, again, community-based organization in order to get people engaged in what's going on inside of classrooms. Our recommendation is relatively modest. Uh, the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation is uh, now phasing out its support for the 21st century schools, and we think that the state should look at picking up some of that support to extend the benefits for those programs. I'm going to turn it back over to Jay to uh, take us home and let you guys ask some questions. So the, the ultimate goal of this report um, is to put the achievement gap um, on the agenda as the area for the next major educational reforms in Arkansas and begin the conversation about this issue among policymakers, uh, community leaders, uh, and parents. Uh, so that we as a state can really take that step. And I think uh, over 200 folks in a room who care about this issue on a nasty Arkansas February day is a great start to that effort. There clearly are people who care about this issue uh, and there is great hope uh, that we can take this step. But uh, as, as we have pointed out, um, there is no single answer. It is going to take concerted efforts that are holistic and multi-pronged and that while the state can do a great deal uh, to aid this work, that ultimately local activism and innovation 
is going to be an important part of this, the story. Arkansas in this decade has had tremendous successes, but there is great work to be done, especially in being certain that all of our school children are able to learn and have uh, the great educational opportunities that this state can bring. But it is possible. Um, there is no problem facing America that has not already been solved somewhere in America. And so with that, we close and um, are glad to answer any questions uh, that you have. Yes, uh, Carol. Hi, thanks for your great report and it's, it's good to see some good things are happening. Um, when you looked at pre-K programs, and the lack of uptake on those programs. Did you see any studies that looked at transportation issues? Because uh, it's just very hard for low-income families to get their kids there and then pick them up in the middle of the afternoon. That's a good question, and I've heard uh, anecdotal evidence about that. I can't say that I read any report that um, gave a solution for transportation issues. Um, so uh, it's also an issue for after-school programs. Um, so having, uh, I think parents recognize that it's a valuable thing to do, but actually being able to do it is a whole other issue. Um, that's one of the reasons why, uh, at least for after-school, we would recommend having some state guidelines and state funding for that. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. I wanted to know, uh, had uh, there anyone taken into the account of uh, allowing African American studies as an um, uh, issue that needs to be discussed? Because uh, I have a <coughs> mentor program in the school district whereby I deal with about 19 African American males, fourth and fifth grade. And I agree that we should grab them early because uh, after they get to about junior high or high school, they've made their decision uh, as a result of BET and the things that they see in the street. So my question is, is there any um, view of adding uh, African American studies because if they have no identity, and that's what African American males are looking for, we're looking for an identity. And if we can't uh, identify with ourselves, then we have an issue uh, such as what we're going through now with uh, lack of responsibility. Uh, we don't take care of our children as a whole. So as, a, uh, as African American males, we have an issue. And I, I try to address it by starting low uh, because I can mold them. I can tell them that a drug dealer is wrong or uh, uh, don't go for the fast money. I can tell them that now, but once I get uh, I'm seeing a problem once I uh, start in junior high. I have a program at Dunbar as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm needing uh, resources because my problem is I'm trying to, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm trying to get resources that are available that can help me facilitate what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. There is a, a particularly interesting program, um, which is a summer program um, in, the, um, in one of the Delta counties, the Freedom School Program which does focus on, um, on uh, African-American um, curriculum and, of course, modeled on the, the, the Freedom Summer Program from 1964-65. From um, um, and that has had, that's a national-based program. There is one uh, outpost in, uh, um, in the Delta. Um, and nationally, that has shown some success, in, uh, especially in, in working with, uh, with, with African-American males in terms of, um, and, and it combines uh, some, some interesting curriculum uh, with, some, uh, with some development of, of traditional academic skills during that summer, especially focused on reading and other things. And so that, I think there is some, some good research out there indicating that, that those programs um, have, um, have some success. We have very little of that activity in, little, in Arkansas, um, but, but this, the, 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 the One Delta program is an example of that. To me, that's a, a justification for why after school and summer programs are so important. I mean, you can't get, only get so much done inside the school day. Um, and then to be supplemental, be more targeted, as long as you have a caring, trusted adult for those kids, then uh, I think that's an excellent path, depending on who your kids are and how you want to connect with them.
Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Nikolai. We did. Yeah, we did. Trying to find the citation. Twenty-four percent more school led to a sixty-six percent gain in reading comprehension and a thirty-three percent gain in math and verbal skills. Spending less time than needed, resulting in a lower degree of learning and lower retention of material one week, one week later, an average decrease of sixteen percent. So yeah, if kids aren't in school, they're not going to learn as well. Yeah, and I think a couple of these areas, first, you know, sometimes it is health issues, um, um, and those, many of those things are, are grounded in, in, in the home experience, uh, but that it is also empowering parents uh, to feel, to see the importance of education and, and feeling conf uh, gaining confidence as parents. So I, so I think a couple of these uh, recommendations really do hit at that issue of uh, being sure that, that students um, have more seat time um, and are able to take advantage of what is, what is accessible in these schools. Thank you. I think the state needs, this is just my own opinion, I don't know what Jay thinks about this, but uh, I think the state needs to set some resources and some framework for the standards at which local innovation um, can occur. So support and then high standards for that. But I don't think the state can prescribe what's going to work in any given community because the communities are different and the children are different. So um, I think pre-K is a model for how that might happen. Yeah, I think the, I think this. Uh, I would agree with Keith in that the the state can do a great deal in terms of of allowing innovation to to take place, um, and I think we need to critically analyze those innovations that occur um, and do the kind of good research so that we really understand what does work, so that there can be good replication around the state. And I think the state can also uh, encourage some, some work in that regard. Is that is that uh, we need better research uh, on many of these these interventions. And the state can do uh, a lot uh, to, uh, and in some cases working with other states, can do a great deal to, to help us understand what, what does work uh, so, that, so that there are wise decisions made uh, when innovations uh, do, do succeed. And so it is a combination, and that is part of this, this story of the, the achievement gap will only be tackled at, at, um, when, when work occurs at different levels. But the state certainly has a, a role and responsibility. The report is, is great, but a report is a first step. The key is what's going to happen as a result of the report being issued, whether or not it motivates individuals and groups and policy makers to begin looking at those issues. So I'm wondering if the organizations, in particular the organizations that came together to sponsor this report, are you looking at developing some strategies to reach out to other elements of the community to build support for the recommendations that are being made so that policymakers can be pulled in and, and shown the value of, of following through on some of this? We'll see if the advocates <laughs> want, to, uh, want to speak in this regard. Rich, you want to have anything to say? Uh, yes, yes. Well, uh, wait for the mic. I take steps to go out um, and educate the public about this report, policymakers around the support, and, uh, and we already have some ongoing initiatives um, in a couple of these areas, like, uh, like for example, the governor um, has already established um, a task force on after school and summer programs. That will lead to recommendations at some point later in the year. So, uh, so yes. Bill, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or not. Uh, the Arkansas Public Policy Panels is one of our major organizing initiatives right now. There's some uh, 
community folks from Gould, I'm not sure where they ended up, but uh, here today from, from that. And our goal is really with the report to have two different conversations, and one's at uh, local levels uh, across the state with communities about uh, how this makes sense to their local circumstances and, and what makes sense there and developing some local initiatives and then with state policymakers with part with other partners like advocates and potentially teachers and others. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Abrams? I would like to know what is the planning to close the achievement gap for the Latino children whose primary barrier is language? English language, because they speak Spanish, most of them. And we have an English-only state. Uh, regardless of how we feel about immigration, the children who are attending our schools fall under the same law that all children should be taught and sh all children should go to school. Thanks for that question. If you look at these charts, the yellow, again, are Latino students, and those are the really only downward trending lines you see, um, particularly in, in eighth grade there for, for math and, and fourth grade for reading. So I think that's a legitimate issue. Um, unfortunately, we did not, I, at least I did not come across anything that was specifically targeted at la Latino children. Um, we did not look at issues about bilingual. We did not look at issues about um, immersion. Um, so I'm, I apologize. States, we have had the most growth with the Latino population in this area. So why did you exclude that segment of society? I think, unfortunately, uh, because of the the relatively uh, um, newness of educational endeavors focused on on that community, that literature is still very much developing, and so we don't yet have the kind of um, research that I think we would feel as confident about in terms of what does work and do, what, what does not work in terms of, uh, in terms of work with Latino uh, school children. I think that, that literature is developing. There are obviously some educational work being done in that area. Uh, and I think pretty quickly we are going to have a lot more insights into w what steps really do need to be occur. And undeniably, I mean, if you, if you look at this report and, and our definition of the, the achievement gap, there's a great deal of focus on uh, Latino uh, children as uh, one group of children who clearly are being left behind uh, in, in, in Arkansas and other places. And so we certainly call for, for attention on that group as a crucial uh, group of students. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're just getting the kind of insights we need into understanding what we need to do uh, as a state to really uh, take steps in that regard. Right. And I think to go back to, to, the, to, to Baker's point or question earlier, I think that's an area in which we, we encourage innovation. And we also encourage the examination with good scientific-based research to really understand better what is working in communities with Latino children so that other communities can learn from those, uh, learn from those lessons. Yes. Did your study take in consideration how long the jet lag is as we transition from an agrarian to a different economic culture? And if so, how long is that jet lag? And the reason why the question is, if we are moving to a new technological educational culture, what will be the impact on that jet lag in an agrarian? State. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, um, I think it, uh, I think it's a fantastic question. I mean, we we uh, any educational sister, system operates in a historical context, and I think that's a, a very crucial point. And I, in many ways, I think it ultimately becomes. Um, a basis for the pride we should have in what has happened this decade. Because it has been 
a reaction against decades and decades of, of, of a historical context that was uh, one in which education was not valued. And that really, in many ways, I think, says, uh, says that we should be even more proud of what has happened this decade. Um, I think that uh, it means that, th that change is going to have to be constant and ongoing and that we will never be able to stand still, even in those couple of areas where we say we've done a lot, we've got to keep doing more in terms of enhancing the facilities so that they are technologically accessible, enhancing the curriculum so it does allow students to take advantage of, of the new opportunities and help them understand the new world. Um, but I, I, I think that I don't have a, the perfect answer for your question, but I do think that, that um, it, it maybe says we've got to be conscious of where we came from. policy holders, and I recall that the history of public policy, uh, people particularly at the legislative level and at the school board level, did not value education because they were a product of an agrarian society. And as I have watched and studied the change in the educational level of public policy uh, leaders at the So which one is an egg and a chicken? Do we need to have a study to see what the educational disparity is in the ladies? <laughs> I, think, I think we have, in the last two generations uh, in Arkansas, I think we've come a long way in terms of the expectation of our state government that it has a responsibility to provide educational opportunities to our children. And I think, uh, I think we've come a long way. Uh, there are, especially in, in certain local communities, undeniably, some steps that still have to be taken. I'll just add that uh, if you look at Arkansas nationwide, a lot of what we're doing here is at the cutting edge of what's going on in education reform. So governor, superintendent, state board, they should be congratulated for getting out in front and being innovative. Yes, sir. And year-round schools. As the, has the, uh, I know California has used year-round schools with some success, and has that been considered in the state of Arkansas? As a school board member, I'm very interested in the subject. Um, there, I know there are some innovations, at least in a couple of uh, individual schools. I know in this district, uh, uh, there is some some innovation in that regard. Um, and um, I, uh, but, uh, but it is a pretty limited uh, effort in Arkansas. And I think to go back to the, the point that Keith, Keith covered on out of school in general, in general, Arkansas has, is behind the curve in terms of innovations with out of school um, education, uh, including extended learning. But there are a couple of examples. We don't yet have uh, the, you know, the, the kind of analysis in Arkansas in terms of those experiments to, to feel as confident. Uh, in terms of, of their success, but I think that there is a, um, based on things that occur in other states, uh, there, there's a lot of logic behind it. We actually looked for that, uh, extended learning, um, and extending the learning calendar, and extended learning day. Um, it's one of the pieces of the KIPP success, extended learning time. Um, in Massachusetts, they are extending the learning uh, calendar and the learning day, but those kinds of initiatives are just starting. So one of our criteria was that it's scientifically proven. We can't say whether or not those work yet. So if three years from now, I think we'll be able to say, yes, what they did in Massachusetts works. But we can't say that yet. We wish we could. <laughs> yes, Joy. <laughs> Aggression. Um, I would like you to comment on two things real quickly. One is, I know in the legislature, a lot of things were done, quite a number of things to provide incentives, and we have learned, at least anecdotally, that it's not exactly working to get teachers to go to places we want them to go. So would you comment on whether or not you think we should not lay education at the feet of the education committees in the legislature, 
but that we should require that the people working in economic development should be in on education committee meetings and they should be looking at, say, pick a place, Earl. It should be as much the responsibility of the Department of Economic Development to have answered that question as well as education because it's a matter of quality of life and so forth to get people to go there. And the second thing I'd like you to comment on is that within a school district, and our larger districts in particular are from one district to another, uh, students get such uneven teaching and uneven curriculum, even within a school district, and how you think that is affecting the achievement gap and what we should do about that. I can take the second one. I don't know about the first one. Uh, having teacher turnover and turnover in your principal, therefore your instructional programs, uh, is a big predictor of problems in a school. The literature would say that. Um, so if you want to find, and this is just again my own opinion, if you want to find a successful school, you'll find a school that's got a stable teaching staff and a principal who's been there a long time, and um, therefore you've got a, a stable environment. And you can apply that, lar arg that logic upward stable school board environment, stable state environment, stable federal environment. And unfortunately, from the federal environment down, there's been a lot of change and a lot of, of reform. So when I talk to teachers, I, the thing I most often hear is just give us a chance to, to do what you've asked us to do. Um, and then maybe you'll see the results that you want to see. And, and I do think some of the, the longitudinal tracking uh, work this will help us understand, you know, um, what is working in terms of those, uh, those differences in terms of the teachers' um, traits um, and, and, uh, and, and backgrounds. Um, on your first question, I think that goes back, it's an implementation question in many ways. And what kinds of steps need to be taken in the advocacy arena to turn uh, these opportunities into reality? And I think the, 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 the example you provide, I think is a very interesting one. And I think we, it's another way in which there is this inherent link between education and economic development. And back again. Uh, and that there are, uh, we, often, we often talk about you know, the education driving economic development. I think you're, you're right, is that having an economically vibrant uh, place creates broader and more vibrant educational opportunities. And I think we need to see that, uh, that interaction. I think, but I think that is an implementation question. I think our project um, didn't go that far in many ways. It, we are, we're trying to get issues on the agenda, uh, but I think that some of the questions that have come out have really been, how do we take this to the next step? And that's, that's what we all hope uh, um, occurs. I hate to do this, but this is our last question. Nikolai, you pick. Ooh. Here we go. Does that mean I win the lottery? <laughs> um, I'm not an educator. Uh, I was a single parent of a child that matriculated through Little Rock Public Schools, and I think that the school system did a great job for him, and he's now in college. However, I'm from the Delta originally, and when I go back home and I talk to my friends who have children that are in the small schools, especially those systems that were consolidated, I find that they don't have technology in their homes, and because their systems have been consolidated, they're farther away from technology in the schools. Did you have any data or any recommendations on the importance of technology as it relates to uh, closing the gap, particularly in those areas where kids are not uh, able to have access to it on an ongoing basis? Yeah, there, on, the, on the facilities piece, um, undeniably, um, the importance of, of, of having technology in the schools becomes most important in those locales where that te technology is not available at all uh, to, uh, to children in terms of the home. I, mean, I think that's, that's pretty clear. And, um, and I think that's why that continued work on facilities uh, becomes so important. And to go back to, to Ms. Abrams' point, um, that we are going to have to continue. That's going to that's gonna keep moving in terms of where the bar is, in terms of what's a well uh, what's truly an adequate facility, especially in terms of technological resources, and it becomes even more important in those, in those communities. And yeah, there is some, I think, some, some pretty compelling research that, yeah, indeed, uh, technology does matter, um, although some of the other things that have been talked about today matter as well. I just want to uh, add that this report is available, A-R, 
advocates.org. And uh, we would be delighted if everybody left here and uh, started reforming their own schools back in their, their home. So thank you very much That's, for coming. Thank you.